Hello, I'm Professor Deborah Chung at University at Buffalo, the State University of New York, and I'm very happy to share with you about aviation, past, present, and future. Uh, this is China, and, uh, and Hong Kong is uh, at the southern uh, end of it, and I, I was there when Hong Kong was British. Um, and uh, this was how it looked like uh, when I grew up there. And that's my family, and I'm the younger one on the right. Um, now, th the start of practical aviation was uh, uh, in the propeller era, the propeller planes, uh, as depicted here uh, in the 1930s. Uh, it involves a big fan at, at the front of the aircraft, and, uh, and the idea is that that big fan makes wind blowing inward. As a result, uh, there is a pressure gradient, and that pressure differential between what's in front and what's behind that propeller uh, causes the aircraft to move forward, and that, that's what we call thrust forward. Um, and in the uh, 1943 to 1958, Lockheed made this uh, uh, bigger propeller plane, and uh, it was uh, really a workhorse. Now, World War II occurred in 1939 to 1945. Uh, there, U.S. and China fought against Japan. And that falls in the era of the propeller planes. Uh, in 1941, China's east coast was mostly occupied by Japan. Um, that's the east coast. And so uh, the back door needed to be used. And the back door involved going across the Himalayas from China to Burma or India. Okay. Now, flying over the Himalayas is very dangerous. Okay. This is China, uh, India and Burma and China up there. Um, uh, the, it's called the hump route due to the shape of the Himalayas, and you can see a propeller plane flying over there. It's considered the most dangerous in the history of aviation because of the high mountains, the strong wind, the thunderstorms and icing, the propeller planes, not jet planes, and inadequate communication, no computer at that time. More than 600 American planes went missing, or crashed, and more than 1,000 men perished in them. This is my mother, Rebecca, in front of her hump flight aircraft and passengers in 1943. She was a nurse. Um, and inside th that aircraft, there was no window, see? And walking along the aisle of the aircraft <laughs> was simply a balancing act. Um, in, in one of the flights, it, uh, the, the, uh, the plane wobbled tremendously for about 20 minutes, and nobody knew what was happening because there was no window. Uh, so after the 20 minutes or so of wobbling, my mother walked uh, to the uh, 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 pilot's cabin in front and asked the pilot what was going on. And the pilot said that a Japanese military plane was following them, so uh, uh, they had to hide between the mountain peaks as they flew. Very, very dangerous. Uh, the propeller planes are very simple, involving a ladder to go up and down. <laughs> um, and my mother w received a number of U.S. World War II medals, as well as the U.S. Congressional Gold Medal for her military work in World War II. The next era of aviation concerns the jet plane. Okay, this is the Boeing 707, Boeing's first jetliner. The first flight was in 1957. Um, the idea of the jet plane is like uh, a balloon, uh, with the air of the balloon gushing out, and as a result, the balloon moves the, in the opposite direction. And this is action and reaction, uh, uh, Newton's third law of motion. Um, and the jet engine involves air being sucked into the front of the engine using a fan. Now, the air is needed uh, to make the combustion, which is needed to make the uh, gas jet. Um, and, and, uh, and then the air is compressed 
air serving as an oxidizer for the combustion. And uh, uh, the fuel is mixed with the air, and then the, uh, that mixture is ignited. You see a flame here. Um, and then the, the gas uh, gushed out from the back of the engine, uh, cr uh, creating thrust forward. And so the reaction force produced by the high-speed jet at the tail of the jet engine makes the aircraft move forward. Okay. Um, the, so air is needed uh, for the jet engine, and so the jet plane cannot fly too, too high, you know, 40,000 square feet probably is, is the max, because when it's above that, that there's just not enough oxygen for, for that jet engine. And troposphere is the uh, 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 part of the Earth's atmosphere where the uh, uh, plane can, can fly in. Now, uh, the speed of the aircraft is described by the Mach number. Uh, um, when it is less than one, it's called subsonic. When it's greater than one, it's called supersonic. When it's m more than five, it's called hypersonic. Okay. And right, uh, right now, with a jet plane, you now we are residing in the subsonic range. Um, now, the speed of sound actually depends on the altitude because of the temperature difference uh, between the low and the high altitude. Okay? The, the speed of sound is not a constant. Um, now, water waves are caused by a moving boat. As you can see, this boat, and behind that you have this uh, water waves. Uh, in the same vein, uh, the aircraft moving causes air waves. Okay? And the, the, the air waves, uh, when, uh, it looks like this, not much, when the aircraft is stationary. And then the uh, air, air waves become like this as the speed increases. And in, in the supersonic range, the, the plane uh, juts out uh, a little bit in front of uh, those air waves. And because of that jutting out, uh, there's a big sound, big noise involved. Um, uh, and one difficulty of the supersonic uh, flight is that the drag is increased. Now, there's the thrust forward and the drag backward, and the drag is increased uh, due to the supersonic situation. Uh, Concorde uh, was a commercial supersonic aircraft, uh, first flight in 1969, and, uh, and the Mach is 2.04. Okay? And uh, Princess Diana and Prince Charles uh, traveled on the Concorde in 1986. Um, however, unfortunately, in 2000, the Concorde crashed, and that led to the end of the Concorde. However, people have not given up on supersonic flights, and commercial supersonic aircraft is in the plan, like here. Now, going forward, uh, we go from supersonic to hypersonic. Okay? Hypersonic even faster. Um, this uh, commercial hypersonic aircraft is still in the plan, and this is Boeing's plan uh, with Mach 5. Okay, so that a flight between New York and Tokyo that currently takes 14 hours would drop to just two hours. Okay. Um, uh, however, it's too expensive to be cost competitive in the next 15 to 20 years. Um, now, the hypersonic uh, uh, flights occur in the stratosphere, okay, where there is n very little air to to hinder the flight, and also uh, uh, because of very little air, uh, the jet engine uh, involving the air as the input uh, would not work. Okay, so they have to use another means, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, now, uh, another problem is that because of the very high speed uh, of the hypersonic aircraft, dissociation of the air becomes significant, and that causes high heat. And because of that heat, the material for the hypersonic uh, aircraft is very critical. Now, always for aircraft materials, it needs to be lightweight. Uh, but in this case, just lightweight is not enough. It has to resist very high temperatures. 
um, uh, right now, carbon fiber polymer matrix composite with a polymer typically epoxy uh, is very important. Uh, but you know, e e polymer or epoxy cannot withstand very high temperatures. Uh, so ceramic fiber metal matrix composite is the next, next best thing. Uh, but that's still not enough in heat resistance for the hypersonic uh, aircraft. And so they have to go with ceramic fiber ceramic matrix composites, which turns out to be non-trivial. And this is how it looks like in microscopic view. You have these fibers, uh, ceramic fibers, and the matrix binding them together is also ceramic, such as silicon carbide. It turns out that the making of these composites so that it's high quality with very little porosity is not easy. Um, However, commercial hypersonic aircraft is in the plan, and, and this is Lockheed Martin's plan for Mark 6, okay? uh, and, and they say that it's probably be airborne by 2030. Now, uh, however, in the non-commercial arena, uh, uh, hypersonic aircraft uh, ha has been around as used for visiting the moon, for instance. This is uh, the Saturn V, uh, this is called the rocket, uh, and uh, this carried uh, men to the moon in 1969. It is Mark number more than seven, hypersonic. Okay, uh, very exciting. First landing on the moon on July 20, 1969. Um, and and then we have another uh, hypersonic vehicle, and that's space shuttle. Uh, Mark number 10 to 25, even faster. And, and that is in the uh, time range from 1981 to 2011. Um, uh, now, for these rockets, uh, uh, like, like the Space Shuttle, uh, they travel in the stratosphere where there is not too much air. Uh, and air is needed for the uh, oxidization, uh, needed for the combustion. Uh, uh, for producing the jet, okay? Um, and when there's not, not too much air, then they have to use a solid uh, kind of oxidizer, uh, uh, which is in blue here. Uh, and so it's the same principle, still combustion, uh, but then instead of using air as the oxidizer, they use a certain solid. And still it's combustion, and you have the gas jet uh, coming out uh, at the tail. Uh, this is uh, the space shuttle in 2003. Unfortunately, it, it disintegrated upon re-entry. Now, re-entry means going from the stratosphere into the troposphere, uh, which has uh, 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 air. Okay? And uh, there's a, a lot of friction involved uh, with the air molecules during the re-entry, so it gets very, very hot, like 1650 degrees C or 3000 degrees Fahrenheit heat uh, during that re-entry. Um, so they need thermal protection in the form of these tiles. These black squares are the tiles, and they are attached to the surface of the space shuttle. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, some of those tiles came off uh, during uh, the, the uh, flight outward. So uh, uh, inward, uh, the, 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 uh, with the re-entry and the high heat involved, uh, the, the, air, uh, the, the space shuttle just blew up and the seven astronauts died. Very unfortunate. Okay. Uh, in the future, we are looking into yet another era, and that's the era of electric aircraft. Well, we know about electric cars, but now people are looking into electric aircraft. Okay? Uh, they call it air taxi uh, because the aircraft is supposed to uh, tr uh, take people uh, from one point in a city to another point in the city uh, very quietly and very quickly, efficiently. It's still under development. Um, uh, now because it's all electric and the aircraft takes a lot of energy, uh, it takes an immense amount of batteries. And that, that's uh, uh, difficult. Uh, <laughs> much of the aircraft's weight is occupied by the batteries. Okay? Now, the reason why they want it electric as opposed to the combustion that we talked about a moment ago is that they don't want it to be noisy. Now, with the combustion, with the jet coming out, it gets noisy. 
and they want, don't want uh, that much noise inside the city. Okay? Uh, and that's why they want it all electric. Now note that uh, this is that, uh, uh, that all electric uh, aircraft is, uh, sitting here. Um, and in, in takeoff, it, it's vertical. And when it lands, it's also vertical. Okay? And uh, it's like a helicopter in that sense. However, a helicopter involves the combustion and it's noisy, and, but this uh, doesn't involve combustion and it's not noisy, it's all electric. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, future. Okay. Now, um, the first landing on the moon occurred in 1969. I was, uh, toward the end of my high school days, I was super excited when I watched the TV. Uh, so I decided to leave Hong Kong for the U.S. at, at the age of 18. I attended the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, a very good school. And uh, it, there, there are 78 Nobel laureates affiliated with Caltech at this time. Um, and I turned out to be one of the four first women graduates of Caltech, um, in the middle here. Um, uh, it's a very good school, and I, I was particularly intrigued by integrated circuits. And Professor Carver, Carver Mead, the father of integrated circuits, uh, taught us back in 1972 how to make and design integrated circuits. And that's truly education at uh, the forefront. Um, I, uh, in addition, I performed research for the first time, and that was under Professor Paul Douay, the father of amorphous metals. And through him, I tasted research for the first time and just fell in love with it. Because research means the pushing of the frontier of knowledge. Uh, and in particular, from uh, Professor Douay, I learned about material science, how materials constitute the foundation of technology, whether it's electronic, aerospace, automobile, construction, whatever, you need materials. Also, materials mark the history of human civilization, starting with the Bron Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and so on. Okay. Uh, after graduation from Caltech, I moved on to MIT, very good school, with 98 Nobel laureates affiliated with it so far. Uh, and that's me in front, uh, at the front door of MIT. Uh, uh, studying for my PhD degree in material science. And I fell in love with graphite there. Uh, this, this is the atomic uh, uh, arrangement uh, in graphite, very beautiful. All these are carbon atoms. And I uh, did my PhD thesis under Professor Mildred Dresselhaus, a very prominent carbon scientist. Um, and graphite has a layered structure. All these balls are carbon atoms. And one can, uh, through a chemical reaction, insert certain um, atoms or molecules between the, the carbon atoms. And it turns out that this insertion gives rise to a change in the electrical behavior so that the graphite becomes a metal, okay? graphite becoming a metal through this insertion called intercalation. Uh, very interesting in physics and chemistry. And I continued this line of research for 15 years. Okay. Uh, however, and, uh, gradually I saw a decline of my field of expertise. And I had already become a, a kind of a world authority on this subject, but this field of mine declined because the application did not quite work out. And so I decided to leave my field of expertise, and, but then where should I go? <laughs> I was like a blank piece of paper. And that forced me to think out of the box. And thinking out of the box turns out to be very important for research, especially for creative research. Uh, and one needs to have the courage to leave one's comfort zone. And to do so, uh, one needs to have a broad education. Um, and I somehow, <laughs> I got interested in concrete, something I've never learned before. Um, and I started to study concrete as if it's an electronic material. It's kind of crazy. And because of that, I invented smart concrete back in 1993. Smart concrete is concrete which is itself a sensor. Uh, and because it contains some short carbon fiber which modifies its electrical behavior. Um, 
Now, sensing has uh, been around uh, for concrete as well as other structures by embedding various devices, various sensors in, in the structure, like embedding it in concrete. Okay? Um, however, I, I don't follow that route. Rather, I use concrete itself as a sensor. There's no device incorporation. And that means low cost, high durability, large sensing volume, and the mechanical performance not being compromised. And there are numerous applications, such as weighing the trucks as they move, traffic monitoring, weighing each room of a building to control the heating, cooling, ventilation for saving energy. Also sensing of vibrations. Also uh, sensing the integrity of uh, the cement ceiling in oil or gas wells. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I was uh, uh, honored in a, a few uh, <laughs> Uh, ways, uh, such as uh, becoming a fellow of ASM, uh, receiving uh, uh, State University of New York's Outstanding Inventor Award, also the Chancellor's Award, also the American Carbon Society's Patino's Award uh, for my carbon research. And it turns out that I was the first woman in, Amer in America to receive this award. And also I received the honorary doctorate degree from University of Alicante in Spain. Um, uh, interesting ceremony, and I turned out to be the first American woman to receive this honor. Um, now, there are a lot of problems still in current aviation. Okay. Um, here's damage of aircraft, nose by hail. Here, damage of aircraft due to bird strike. Okay. Here, aircraft accident due to fatigue. Okay. The fatigue cracks occurred due to the degradation of lap joints, looking like this. The joint uh, degraded. And this is American Airlines Flight 589. It fell in 2001 to New York City, killing over 2,000 people. And that was because of the tail of aircraft coming off. <laughs> Again, a joining problem. Screws and, and bolts, you know, what we call fastening problem. It seems old fashioned, right? Just fastening, but that was it. Uh, so the technology is not 100% reliable, not at all. Uh, here's a plane crash due to corrosion, another culprit. Uh, corrosion particularly occurs at uh, 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 joints again. Uh, uh, and here, you see a joint and corrosion occurring particularly around there. And so, aircraft inspection is very important. Looking at not only the joints, but every, every, uh, every place, including the engine. Okay? Um, however, uh, such checking, even though important, is not, it's just now and then. It's not all, uh, all the time, you know. Uh, and it would be nice if the integrity of the aircraft can be monitored in real time. Okay. Uh, and, and that monitoring uh, uh, requires a sensor network. Uh, that's, that's what uh, uh, people are trying to do. Okay. Just like a person having a sensor network, that your nerves in, inside the person, uh, the aircraft, they want a sensor network. Uh, for doing what they call structural health monitoring in real time. Uh, and this, here you can see different nodes uh, for the sensors. Um, how, however, there are problems with such sensor incorporation, high cost, low durability, and mechanical performance loss. And I am one of the pioneers in what they call self-sensing, that is, not using any embedded or attached sensor, but using the structural material itself, namely the carbon fiber composite, as the sensor. Okay. That is, the structural material's electrical behavior uh, changes uh, in accordance with the deformation or the damage. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and this is uh, something that is close, very close to my heart. I've spent some decades working on that. Another problem is flutter. That is vibration of the wings or other aircraft structures due to the aerodynamics. You can see these wings you know, vibrating up and down. And, and that obviously is, is a problem. 
and satellites have, uh, have these big things uh, hanging out, uh, International Space Station also, and obviously vibration of these structures would be a big problem. So one needs vibration damping, that is reducing the vibration by absorbing the mechanical energy. Um, and the usual way of doing that is to use polymers such as rubber. Okay? Uh, however, uh, uh, this route has a problem because the, the, the polymer or the rubber is not stiff, it's soft. Okay? Also, it's low strength and also poor durability. Okay? The rubber be, it becomes brittle after maybe a year, right? Uh, uh, however, what I have done, which is quite revolutionary, is to use the structural material as, uh, for, for, for its own damping. Okay? Um, and that means high durability, since it's a structural material. Also high stiffness and large volume. And large volume turns out to be very important because the amount of uh, uh, mechanical energy that can be absorbed is proportional to the volume. And when you use the structure uh, to do that, uh, you are involving very large volume compared to putting some rubber in it. Uh, noise reduction is also needed, and noise is actually a pressure wave, also a mechanical wave. Uh, and so a similar uh, 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 technique can be used for noise reduction, just like vibration damping. Uh, noise absorption is particularly needed around the engine, which is the most noisy part of the aircraft. Another problem is lightning. Okay, this is a 2019 Russian aircraft that crashed due to lightning. Okay. Uh, and so aircraft needs lightning strike protection. And that means you need to have a, an electrical conductive path so that the lightning strike coming in can travel and, and go out uh, uh, rather than staying there and, and ruining the aircraft. So electrical conductivity is very important uh, for lightning protection. Now, uh, it used to be aluminum aircraft, but nowadays more and more carbon fiber composite aircraft. And it turns out that carbon composites, even though they are wonderful in terms of uh, the mechanical properties and the light weight, they are actually uh, not conductive, not as conductive as the aluminum. So uh, lightning protection needs work there. Uh, and, and composites uh, is now uh, utilized uh, quite a lot. Uh, 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 in aircraft, carbon fiber composites. Another problem is icing, you can see. Um, the, uh, this is an accident due to the weight of the ice on the aircraft. Uh, so de-icing is important. And nowadays we use fluid de-icing, which is really chemical de-icing, and, uh, uh, and you, you've all experienced that this aircraft being washed <laughs> by that de-icing fluid um, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, air, uh, in the airport. Um, unfortunately, this de-icing fluid causes a lot of pollution. In addition, it's, uh, the de-icing is only when the aircraft is in the airport. Now, while, while it's flying, it, you cannot do this. Um, uh, another way is infrared de-icing. Uh, that, that doesn't cause the pollution, uh, but this is very expensive. Uh, so what I have developed is um, a, he a heating material, heating element, in the form of graphite that is flexible. And, and that, that, that turns out to be very effective uh, for um, heating. That is, you send a current into this graphite conductor, and uh, it heats up, um, and that heat can be used for the de-icing. And this flexible graphite uh, de-icing material is particularly put in uh, 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 at the leading edge of the aircraft. Now, stealth aircraft uh, is an, another beast. Uh, to the radar, the stealth aircraft is as small as a bird. Yeah. That's why it, uh, uh, militarily is very useful. You don't want the enemy to be able to detect the aircraft by using a radar. And the reason why a stealth aircraft can do that is because it has jagged shape. 
com uh, usual aircraft you know, has kind of round, you know, not jagged shape. Okay? And because of that uh, roundish shape of the conventional aircraft, the radar uh, radiation uh, uh, gets reflected back to the radar, and so the aircraft gets detected. But for the stealth aircraft, because of this jaggedness, uh, the incoming radar signal gets reflected in an off angle uh, so that it doesn't go back to the radar, and therefore the radar doesn't quite detect the aircraft. Okay. Um, but there is an, a, a, an added issue, which is uh, th th there's uh, uh, heat involved. Right? Uh, and, uh, and the heat can be detected by the enemy by using thermal camera. So the aircraft needs to be cooled. Um, so cooling uh, is, in, is needed. Uh, now, we can learn a lot from birds flying. Okay? Uh, very maneuverable, the wings going up and down, and so on. Um, and this uh, is uh, uh, a kind of a smart aircraft with the flaps and sl slats uh, um, uh, being automatically uh, uh, moving uh, so as to control uh, the aircraft in real time. Okay. Uh, here is a variable wing kind of aircraft, so the aircraft wing can spread out like this, or like this, or even like that. Okay. Uh, and, and the optimum geometry of the wings depends on the speed, okay. so they can change the geometry in accordance with the speed of the aircraft. And this is uh, such, a uh, such an aircraft. Um, um, but if we look at a bird, we are just nowhere near the aviation of, uh, capability of a bird. Uh, the bird is so agile, fast, durable, small, and quiet. Okay? No need for aircraft r runways, no need to recharge batteries, and no pollution. Uh, here is a dragonfly with great lifting power. You, you see, this is very small. And this is the tip of one's finger. Okay? And the dragonfly's wings are designed to create little whirlwinds over their top surfaces. And that's why the dragonfly has enormous lifting power. Um, but if you consider our present aircraft, it has limited agility. It needs aircraft runways to go up or down. It gives pollution because of the combustion engine. And it's noisy. Uh, and it's also big and not miniaturized. So we are a long way from the technology embodied in the birds. So mankind's intelligence is really tiny compared to nature's intelligence. Brian Josephson, Nobel Prize winner of 1973, he said, intelligent design is valid science. In vocation, we have to recognize that there's a calling. It's not just, oh, it's fun, it's make good money. No, it's our lifelong calling. It's the intersection between what uh, is one's passion and what the world needs. Okay? And it takes sustained work, not just work over a summer or a couple of years. It could be a few decades of sustained work. And I've worked for uh, 50 years almost. Uh, uh, and in addition, success requires uh, um, you know, humility, uh, hard work, intelligence, uh, 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 and, but then uh, ego and jealousy and, and che cheating and so on, and laziness, that would uh, get you down. So I hope that all of you would succeed, succeed greatly in your career. Thank you.